All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, thanks for joining us today. A couple of quick reminders before we get started. Everybody is muted. If you're using the event app, we encourage you to check into the session, update your activities, and please be sure to complete the session survey. The session is TLP white and is being recorded. Recordings will be available within 24 hours via the app or the desktop mobile site. And with that, I'd like to introduce your session moderator, Dr. Serge Droz. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, thank you, Tracy. Yes, and hello, everybody, to uh, an end to the slow coming on the end of the conference. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce Sid Hanford, Principal Engineer at Proofpoint. Uh, I'm not going to read a long bio, so the floor is yours, Sid. Um, don't forget to put questions into the QA. And with that having said, uh, now it's really yours. All right. Thank you very much, Serge. I appreciate that. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Seth Hanford, and I'm going to be talking to you today about using known compromised passwords from Troy Hunt's Have I Been Pwned password list to protect my enterprise. Uh, if anyone's not familiar, the Have I Been Pwned service collects, normalizes, and publishes SHA-1 and NTLM hashes for over 500 million passwords as of June of this year. So a brief story on how this process all began. Uh, we had a new employee send an email to our CEO and some other senior leaders uh, in the company, essentially saying, our password policy is painful. Uh, complex passwords are changing too frequently. NIST has new guidance saying, we don't even need to do it this way anymore. Can we make this better? And so empowered by leadership, I stepped up and put a team together to look into what we could do and how. And so I wanna start by saying thanks to everyone involved from top to bottom, leadership to employees who helped to give us the idea. So Josh, thank you for speaking up and asking uh, that great question. And then to the fantastic team that did the implementation technically, uh, Anand and Slava and others involved, Will, Ed, Scott, Dwayne, and all, the, all our leadership. It was really uh, great. I, I really consider this a chance of a lifetime opportunity to make security better and the experience easier while being fully supported and encouraged by leadership. These opportunities don't come around every day, uh, especially in security, and so I'm really glad to have had the chance. So a bit about me, as Serge said, I'm principal engineer and security architect at Proofpoint. Uh, my scope includes uh, assisting with compliance, C-cert activities, P-cert activities, uh, design, and other consulting with business partners. Um, just to make sure that we're doing things the best that we can. And my goal today is to really tell you about the how and why Proofpoint can use long-lived passwords, reduce the complexity of password composition, and make sure we're keeping up to date on known compromised passwords and rejecting them as candidates for password sets and resets. A little bit about where we started. So our organization required long, complex user passwords, and we were requiring just every 60 days, so very painful. Um, this project in, uh, had in scope user memorized secrets. So it doesn't apply to what we do with service accounts or other non-memorized secrets like API keys. This is really about what are we asking users to make uh, uh, unique and memorable. And then further, this is really related to our internal passwords. It's not something that was a customer facing change. This is for employees and, and how they access systems. So why are we doing this? Expiring complex passwords hurt us. They're hard to remember. And expiring passwords are gonna require regular mental effort from users. And when users have so many sites where passwords should be unique, that effort just compounds. So it leads users, as lots of studies have shown, to generate uh, password generation patterns and reuse because they need shortcuts to remember all of these secrets users are likely to reuse passwords or those password patterns even across organizations. So even if your organization like mine requires, uh, a, you know, has a policy that requires users to use a password unique to the organization, it may be technically unique, but based on a pattern that's used elsewhere. And what does that mean? If, if compromised passwords from any source uh, are, are, are made available to an attacker, they become a risk to your organization. And that risk increases with expiry frequency because users are going to uh, have to do this more often and the patterns may become even more predictable. A compromised password that follows a pattern, even if it's an old password, if the, pa if the pattern increments or has some other indicator can be used to not only predict your current password, 
but they could also predict all future passwords for your user. So we want to stop that. And so a successful implementation will address online and offline attacks, including credential stuffing. And we're going to use compliance with NIST Special Publication 863B. Uh, and that's also going to add some additional hardening controls for us. So we want to keep things simple. We want memorized secrets. Uh, according to compliance with NIST 863B, uh, you'll have memorized secrets that are greater than or equal to eight characters. They will have no expiry, no complexity requirements. And you'll be uh, ensuring that condemned uh, and uh, that you will condemn and rotate compromised passwords. And there's some additional controls that you'll gain. Uh, but it's important to note that these controls are designed to be implemented together. And it's unsafe to choose controls that you like, such as no complexity, without those that you aren't ready for, such as checking against the compromised password. And again, to, to note that these are really about um, controls for memorized secrets, and you should use different controls for service accounts and other secrets. Um, there is some opportunity for, for modification. For example, in many cases, it's not safe to just use eight characters. So length is the kind of control that you might increase, um, you know, where others, you really should take a look at your risk and, and understand, um, you know, not to modify them just because it's convenient to you. Um, in this case, we're going to be talking about addressing this according to level two or AAL2 in the standard. Um, so I'll be speaking with that as a reference point. Uh, it's a moderate level of security um, and, and it fit our risk tolerance. Um, but you can see from the additional controls, we also get great benefits in the password space uh, that users really appreciate. And remember that no expiry is really one of the key benefits. Obviously, it's why you're here. It's why you want to get into this uh, position because you want to help your users and make security better. Um, but that key benefit allows users to choose long, strong passwords that last until they're shown to be compromised. So I want to talk a little bit about the have I been pwned approach. It's something that we adopted into our architecture. Um, it's uh, using a an algorithm that was developed in partnership with a cloud player because of the way that the service works online. Um, they used the K anonymity approach. And, and if you haven't read into it, it's really fascinating. It's, it's a great read. There's a lot of blogs um, that Troy has done on this topic uh, and, and Cloudflare, Cloudflare as well uh, that talk about it. But essentially what you do is you generate an unsalted hash of a proposed password. You then take the first five characters of that hash and you send it to the compromised password service. In response, you will receive a list of all hashes known to be compromised whose first five characters match the five characters that you sent. And then you take the hash that you have and compare it against the returned list. If your hash, if the full hash is found on the list returned to you, you reject it. It's known compromised. So, you know, Troy worked with uh, Cloudflare uh, to design this method to send the request. It's not going to compromise secrecy, but does allow for scalability and performance. And in our use, we really had to understand this model and ensure that we weren't breaking security or, or weakening security and missing assumptions that went into their service design. So it's important to read up on that if you're going to do a similar implementation. As you can see, you can also do this offline. And that's what we opted for. Uh, it's a download of about 11 gigabytes. It's, again, over 500 million hashes as of June of this year. But one of the things that was important to us, since our adoption of NIST 863B required us to condemn known compromised passwords, we couldn't just use the online service. We wanted to also check internally compromised passwords, say if a user is phished or if we do a phishing simulation and a user falls for it. We want to make sure that um, we're taking our potential compromises and we're going to put them through a process to condemn them um, and include them so we can't just use have I been pwned? All right. We also need to address some key risks um, along the way. So, you know, reading through uh, the NIST document, we're selecting our AAL2 control level, gather those controls. We need to do a gap assessment and understand, you know, where are we according to the controls that we're going to need? Do we have external dependencies? Yes. You know, we have have I been pwned as a service. If they go away, then, you know, we, we have an issue. Also, you know, other things. Can we use mutual TLS in all cases? Um, for remote logins like VPNs, uh, what maintenance is needed for this compromised password store? Um, so yes, you know we're going to update from have I been pwned 
and internally, but what happens if that goes offline? It becomes unavailable. And, and here I'm not speaking about service availability. I'm not going to design an internal service that's more available than the online service that they provide. But what if they close up shop? Well, that was an interesting question that we asked. And it was really quite interesting because as we were going through our process uh, in June of 2019, um, you know, Troy released a blog and said, I'm, you know, this is really hard. It's hard to maintain. And I'm going to, um, you know, be looking into selling have I been pwned. And then of course, by March of this year, uh, Troy released another blog and said, no, I'm actually not going to sell it. Um, but that he, he called Project Svalbard and his decision process is also really interesting reading. Um, but if you follow Troy on Twitter, like I do, you see a lot of pictures of him, you know, the Gold Coast of Australia and this beautiful location riding around on the jet ski. You know, he, he's got a pretty uh, great setup, right? And and so we knew in advance, it's a one-man operation. He's in a fantastic situation. He does great work, but if he wants to retire, who can blame him? So we really wanted to make sure that we took all of those things into consideration and we're glad that he's still operating. It's fantastic service, really helps, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, wish him all the best, of course. Um, so with that, you will know, talk a little bit about the technical implementation that we got into. So you can see here, we're going to, as I mentioned, we're going to do an offline and we're going to re-implement essentially the function that the website and the web API uh, for Have I Been Pwned does, and that's here at the center, our exposed password service. That exposed password service is going to reach out to Have I Been Pwned, check to see if there are new passwords available, and it's going to download uh, the offline list. Um, and then we're going to uh, store that in our compromised password uh, database. It's going to have a couple of tables. We're going to use the pub list and we're going to put that in our public password store. And then any private compromised passwords go into our private table. Um, any request that comes in through the load balancer from either LDAP or Active Directory, checking for passwords is going to send five characters, just like in the normal K anonymity hash approach uh, to that exposed password service. But then the list is generated uh, by looking at both tables. So any publicly known passwords that start with that hash or any privately known passwords that start with that hash. Um, and we're going to rely on sort of the password quality checks that are available to you, whether you're using Windows or Linux or whatever other LDAP, um, you know, or password uh, checking solution. So look for those as you do your implementation and essentially use this check uh, as, you know, your uh, uh, quality step instead of a, say, complexity check. Um, it's really important also to note that since we have a private table, we need to restrict who can request hashes. Well, why is that? Anyone can make a hash request to the online public Have I Been Pwned service. And so an attacker could um, take a five, take a hash, a, a potential hash uh, for a user. And in this case, I'm speaking of potentially an internal user who is, uh, or, or an attacker who has access to the service internally. If they take a proposed password and they submit it, they get a list from us that potentially includes different hashes than what's available publicly. So if they diff those lists, if they compare them and they pull out everything that's available publicly, they could know this is a password that was used here. Now, you say, well, only compromised passwords go in the private database. Yes, but again, we've established that users use patterns. And so if they've used our password as a pattern, potentially we're compromising our own user security uh, where we may be exposing a pattern that a, a um, user has used elsewhere. And we want to protect user privacy. We want to protect our users, uh, uh, not just at work, but in their own personal lives as well. So even though they're not supposed to, if they've used that password elsewhere, we want to make sure that that's private. Um, so that's an important thing. And then there's also this CSERT use case. So in the event of an incident, we give our CSERT users the ability not just to read uh, passwords from the service, but also to post into the service. So they can uh, send a post request uh, with a uh, hash for a compromised password and, and, and submit it and add it to that private table in the event of a compromise. All right, maintenance workflows. I talked a little bit about that. Um, designing this technical method to update and maintain that table. Since we wanted to regularly consume the public data, we wanted a separate table for private passwords. This satisfied access control. And it also gave us the ability to more quickly just drop that old table. And it's much more performant to just say, here's the new uh, updates, you know, build that, build that table directly. Um, we also had to build that CSERT workflow to uniformly hash passwords and submit them as condemned. And we needed to address user resets. So 
there's a lot of ways you can do this. You may be uh, using commercial tools or other options. Um, so I want to speak generally to what we believe is an ideal flow for us. You might want to look into this and see how it fits with you and what things you could or couldn't adopt. It's never good, in my opinion, to ask users to submit passwords to many online forms, right? That's just bad practice. It leads to encouraging people to do phishing. So if you can unify that experience, it's best. And our ideal flow might look something like this. Ask a user to confirm their old compromised password. So if you have a user who's been phished, you say, go to this site to reset it. It's best if this site is the same site that they use to set passwords and reset passwords all day long. We're going to use one single uh, known easy URL. Uh, it's not complicated. It's internal. You know, it has all the hallmarks that you can to say this is a trusted thing and you use it frequently. So you ask the user to confirm their old compromised password. So then this will take a hash and it will uh, then use that hash of the old compromised password uh, or the normal login sequence to check and see is this user able to log in with that old password? Yes. Then you ask a user to set a new password. And this is the one that we'll use to do the have I been pwned check against the new uh, the password against uh, the known compromised. And if it's OK, we'll accept that for, cha for changes. Since we've confirmed the user's old hash was valid, then we do our reset. We can then take that hash of the old password and condemn it. Now, what does this do? It preserves user privacy, because the CSERT doesn't need to find, use, or otherwise retrieve that old password from the user who's experienced the compromise. It simplifies the end user experience, and it means that we can hash it in both SHA-1 and NTLM as necessary to you know, um, provide those hashes in line with what we get from have I been pwned as a service. And so finally, we had to look into some, some, spend some time looking at what resources and procedures we would use in the event that something like a project vault come up again and Pwned would decide to go offline or change the way it did business. So we planned and prepared sort of how would we keep our own database updated of, as you would, uh, publicly known breach passwords and add them to the table, do normalization. So, Thankfully, as I said, uh, Troy is continuing with his work. And uh, so we'll just keep those uh, items on the shelf and uh, hopefully not have to use them anytime soon. So lastly, I want to talk about lessons learned and next steps. One of the key things that we did was a rolling deployment. Um, we wanted this to be a good user experience, but we couldn't set all users to a longer password expiry uh, in Active Directory while they still had old potentially bad passwords. So say a, a user was able to set password 12345 exclamation point, and they'd been using that password and they had their pattern and you know passed our complexity checks and you know our length and whatever it was. But if we just say, hey, the next time you set a password, you'll be checked against uh, our compromised password store. And I'm going to up your expiry to you know forever or what have you. Um, we would basically be extending the life of that terrible password. So we rolled out the service while our 60-day expiry was still in effect. Then at the end of, uh, so within that next 60 days, each user in the organization would have a password change. So those new passwords were going to be checked to see if they were known compromised. And so along that rolling 60 days, the users are going to set to new um, 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 robust passwords. And then at the end of the 60 days, they would have another password change. But at that 61st day, we would up the expiry. So at the end of the 60 days, they would all have a simple non-compromised password. And then after the 60 days had elapsed, they'd have one more password change. But, but under that new change, the lifetime increases. So we knew that anyone who had a password greater than or equal to 60 days old had a good one, and we were fine to increase the expiry. So we continue to use this method uh, to make the process more or less seamless with at least some noticeable benefit. So in that first 60 days, the users got simple passwords that weren't compromised. And then the second change, they got simple long lived passwords and that password could live as long as you needed it to. Um, so I just mentioned we were doing this in a phased approach uh, because you know, in our case, some controls that we needed to implement weren't ready. And as I mentioned previously, it's important to not just pick and choose. We did want to make a risk-based assessment of which controls we could do now, which might take more time, phase them into our adoption of the standard, and we were able to move uh, quickly and keep ourselves to that aggressive timeline uh, to close the gap on those missing controls. Uh, the private password store was another interesting um, 
uh, situation. So we were trying to figure out how to handle user resets and the complication and how it integrated with various tools that we used. And so this was a great time to have dialogue, not just from security people, but you know, admins and 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 uh, you know, developers, everybody at the table. And you know, one of the participants asked us, "Well, do we need a custom password reset tool in this case that checks the old password and condemns it, sort of like I mentioned in my ideal flow?" And I said, "Well, you know, that's a really great question. Um, we, we thought, well, what other options would we have?" And so someone suggested, "Well, what if every time a user sets their password, we just pre-condemn it? So if I'm my new simple password, like correct horse battery staple. And of course, you know that one's already condemned, but say it was available. Uh, if I'm going to set correct horse battery staple, why don't I just pre-condemn that? And then anytime a user's password gets compromised, they won't be able to you know, give that password if they wanted to continue that pattern or try to keep uh, that uh, in, in place. Um, we could just hash it and store it. And then at any password change, we don't need to say, is the user really giving us their actual password? We still don't need the CSERT to go and look at their password or, or ask them for it. Um, it takes out any of those issues. And we could just say, hey, their old password's already in the list. But of course, we can't do that. Well, why is that? In order for K, -an K anonymity to work, we need to have unsalted hashes so that we can use the same hash list that we get from Have I Been Pwned. And so what that would do is it would mean that private password database would now be a weak point in our environment. So these are really interesting kinds of things to ask because since those hashes would be unsalted, we only want condemned passwords in the list. Um, we, we don't want to introduce risk. Downgrading enterprise security and saying, hey, you know, you can't easily get at hashes, you know, for this service or that service. But if you go and attack this database, you then get all current and previously compromised unsalted hashes that would be a huge problem. So it was a great discussion. I'm so thankful that that got asked because those are the kinds of things that you need to do in your organization. Ask those questions, get that input from, from stakeholders, try to find those places where shortcuts or um, things that improve user security help you. Um, I'm so thankful for you know those kinds of, of, of inter interactions and it was great. It was, it was essential for our project uh, to succeed in the way that it did. Because at the end of the day, the last lesson that I learned this was an absolute joy. So many things we do in security are complicated or they make things more difficult for users, they create friction. But I just want to again express my deep thank leadership and coworkers at Proofpoint. We got a lot of great feedback from our users and I absolutely love the chance I had security better, people's computer experience more enjoyable. And I really wanted to share this with all of you because anyone else in security who has an opportunity to take on a project like this, it's it was just amazing to, you know, do both of those things. And that was that was sort of the, the key thing for me that I took away was just joy. So that's it for me. I hope it was helpful. And uh, thank you very much for your time. Okay, thank you, Sid. That was kind of really, really interesting talk. And I think you probably did more for security by making it easier for users than that than installing another password assessment tool and stuff like this. There's actually quite a couple of questions. So someone are, someone actually seems seems to uh, mirror my feelings about saying, I'm really eager to hear how this made employees very, very happy. Uh, so that's good. Then Arkadeep asks, are you sure that Have I Been Pawned will be able to detect all compromised passwords? If not, what is the accuracy of Have I Been Pawned? I mean, so in my experience, um, all of the um, breaches that Troy uh, has been able to put into, um, you know, that of, you know, 570 million passwords, um, not tried, uh, hasn't been in the, the list, at least, um, you know, not before long. Um, I think, you know, he and the team do a fantastic job there. So I think that, um, I can't guarantee that all compromised passwords go into it, but from a service that's free, uh, the amount of threat that's there uh, really helps. Uh, you know, NIST doesn't specify how much security you need from this or, or how you maintain your list. For us, it was a great fit. Um, and so I asked way better than average. Okay. Um, 
I would say that that mirrors my experience. So the next question uh, by Kesnila is, did you consider using password managers? Password managers are fantastic. Absolutely recommend password managers um, generally. Uh, at the end of the day, um, you know, it, it, security is layered. And while you can recommend the use of password managers, users have to log into something. Um, and so having a solution that helps um, for user logins where secrets must be memorized is also important. So in my opinion, why not both? Okay, cool. Then uh, another question by Robin Stevens. How often have you seen people actually trying one of the compromised passwords? Um, yeah, so um, I, um, I think that in terms of TLP white, I'll give a general there um, and just say the great solution is that a potentially compromised password going to get a sort of reject message. And so in that reject message, it's, you know, they, they just have to try, uh, try again. Uh, we give good guidance about how to construct a memorable passphrase. And uh, we haven't had any user complaints um, that they're unable to find a solution to the problem of setting a good password. Okay, then the uh, next question by Peter is uh, similar to the previous one. Do you do you plan to import passwords from other sources than have I been panned? Like from some other breaches that have I been panned is not aware. Given the scale and scope of have I been pwned, we haven't um, found a need to do that, but our service easily makes that available. We would just add additional tables. If we have additional sources, we would want to normalize them. Uh, we have to make sure that the passwords uh, were vetted that they were either unsalted SHA-1 or un unsalted NTLM so that they could be compared uh, you know, uh, uniformly uh, in the service. So if you have other sources that you prefer, uh, it's just as easy as adding a new table. Okay, and then there's two similar questions posed by an anonymous attendee or anonymous attendees. Uh, one is how was this tied to Active Directory and the other one does this need a special password change site or does it enter kind of work out of the box in Mr. Windows password tools. Absolutely. On the Windows case, um, capabilities to run a um, uh, a external service um, um, to you know check the quality of a password. And so you can tell your domain controllers to you know use this uh, program to make the change. And that would be essentially that program would need to reach out to this internal service. Um, so it looks exactly like a normal user password change. They hit control alt delete to change their password. And it's going to on the back end uh, query our, our service to do that. Okay, then an, another question, um, how, how do you avoid iterations like P, PDW01, PDW02 and so on and so on? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this particular troll doesn't prevent those iterations, right? We're checking against the compromise that hasn't been previously compromised. It doesn't solve that problem. But if a candidate password isn't on a list of 572 million known passwords already, and it's long, uh, you know, you can set the length that is appropriate to your organization. Uh, the chances of something like that being a, a risk uh, to us wasn't um, uh, wasn't significant enough to you know prevent us from taking this step. Okay, cool. And then there's a, <clears throat> another question. I still don't understand how you dealt with the problem of having unsalted an unsalted password base. Could you go further on to that? Absolutely. So in order for K-anonymity to work. Um, Passwords, uh, a hash of a password must have five characters that can be found in the list. So if you salt each password individually, you will never find matches that are correct. Um, so you have to have unsalted passwords in the have I been pwned data set. In our private compromise store, we also want to use unsalted passwords so that we understand whether or not we have duplication already uh, and can use essentially, again, that same five character password, five characters that are sent into the service to return. 
uh, the password that we're looking for with one call. So in doing that, um, we do make, uh, we, we do introduce some risk in that we have unsalted passwords in that compromised private data store. So we want to heavily protect that. And we want to provide the right controls around that service. It is not generally accessible from inside our organization. It's accessible only to the tools that need to do the checking. So we, we protect that system and we protect access to that API to even ask the questions, unlike have I been pwned, which is open to the world. Um, so there is some risk, but we only put passwords that are known compromised in that. So to our organization, they should have no, that should create no exposure. I am, I want to be clear. I am not saying at all that we have stopped password hashing in LDAP and Active Directory. We're still using, uh, you know, strong controls there. It's only in this one table of this private data store that we would uh, store unsalted hashes in order to match them against uh, the same results um, that you get inside of um, uh, that, that have I been pwned set. Okay, one last question because we are already a bit over time. Um, is there a password, is this password service open source or are there any open source tools around that do this? There are some uh, solutions to problems like this that are of um, uh, put together for organization that we have not opened. Okay, you seem to drop, like your sound drops every now and then, so maybe you, you want to try to answer this again. Uh, I'm sorry, one more time. So there are some open source solutions that solve pieces of this problem. The overall solution I described has not been open sourced uh, by Proofpoint. Okay, hey, thanks a lot. I think that was a really interesting talk. I enjoyed that very much. And then uh, thank you. And with that, we end the session. Bye, Sid. Bye to all the audience.